Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? If you hear barking in the background and an occasional snort it is because the neighbors have brought over their goats. We have a big patch of weeds back here and the goats are eating them and the dogs are going crazy over it. So if you hear that, pay it no mind. The dogs are just acting fools. So uh, this morning we're going to be reading out of Numbers 14, 11. How long will it be ere they believe me? This is an interesting verse. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? You know, I think if I had to guess, and I, I don't presume to speak on behalf of God on this, but if I had to guess, I would say this is probably one of his greatest complaints of all history of all mankind. How long will they not believe me? Even with all these things I've done. I think that's probably his biggest complaint. And that's just me guessing. That would be mine. Top three easily. How long before they finally believe me? With Even with all that I've done. What would it take? And there's other verses in the Old Testament. Where in the, in the prophets. <laughs> where he's like. What else can I do? What else can I show you? You know, what What else would it take to get you to see? So if I had to, if I had to guess, just, just guessing, this is probably top three biggest complaints from God about us. Let's go up here. Start here in verse five. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation. You guys know what this is. This is when they went in. We're like grasshoppers to them. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. These guys have faith. So this is what the Lord said. This is what's going to happen. We believe it. Verse 9, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. These guys are like, come on, y'all. You know the truth. This is no big deal for us. The Lord is with us. Verse 10, and all the congregation said to stone them with stones. The response was not to believe God. Okay, well, these guys believe it. You know what? We'll walk on their confidence. Okay, let's go. You're right. Nope. Instead, they want to pick up rocks and throw rocks at them. They want to stone the two guys that are correct. How interesting that out of all the people that went, only two, the few, the remnant that, that actually believe. How has that been like that the whole time? Only the remnant believes. And the response of the other people is to attack them and kill them. How, that's like literally the same response we get. I tell you this of a certainty. If people knew they could get away with stoning us, me and you, because we believe, they would do it. I'm talking about friends and family. M much less strangers. They would stone us. If they thought they could get away with it, they would do it. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? You know, Jesus made a very similar statement. I forget where it's at, but he said, how much longer must I endure you? I do all these things and you don't believe me. Jesus did the same thing and had the same complaint. Verse 12, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a greater nation and mightier than they. Interesting statement. I wonder what he's talking about, or in this case, who is he talking about? I will make of you a gr mightier, a nation greater and mightier than they. He's going to turn them into a better nation, but he's going to deal with them first. He was going to make a different nation out of them. He was going to take them out, but make a different nation. 
And, and the Lord had to deal with this for thousands of years. Thousands. But he knows how it's all going to play out. And then Moses intercedes for the people. And Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear it. For by your might, you brought these people up from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people. That you, Lord, are seen face to face. And your cloud stands above them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring his people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering and abundant in mercy. You see what he's doing? And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, just like you promised, saying, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. God promises that he was praying the promises back to God. And look at God's response, and we'll, we'll change out there. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly as I live, all, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And he goes on, he's going to bring judgment on them because of it. It's actually a pretty interesting chapter, and it has a lot of future tones to it. But uh, yeah, you can see Moses was doing the very thing, praying the promises. It means something. It matters. Not, not because he caught God off guard, but because God was waiting to see what Moses was going to do. And Moses did exactly what he should do. And God said, okay, we'll do it that way. God was already going to do it that way. Anyway, what he was waiting for was to see if the person that he chose to stand up was going to stand up. And he did. Strive with all diligence to keep out that monster unbelief. This is probably the biggest issue we have in this generation is unbelief. We don't truly believe. We don't trust God or take him at his word or believe that he'll do exactly what he said he will do. That's why you have so many people that go from pre-trib to post-trib. They just switch out of nowhere. I've had a bunch of people on this channel. You know, I'm starting to change my mind. They, they commented that. I think I'm starting to change my mind. One of them, I asked him, I said, what would cause you to do that? A bunch of them never responded. But one person responded back. They make a better case than you. And I responded back to them and I told them I was like, a better case? But I'm not making a case. The Lord has made a case and I'm proclaiming the case he made. It's his word, not mine. I'm not trying to prove his word. I'm just reading to you what it says. It's very clear and obvious what he's talking about. If they're making a case, it's because they're trying to prove themselves right, not God's word right. Because they only talk about themselves and what they believe, not what God said. So what do you hear me preaching you here? This is what God said. We should believe it. He said, I'm making no case for nothing. If you're taking somebody's word over the Bible, that's a problem. So I, I implore you to change that, to not listen to man, but to listen to God, because when you listen to God, then you'll know the truth. But there's a lot of people doing that. Today. That's just one example. There are a lot of people doing that today. They don't believe the promises of God. It so dishonors Christ that he will withdraw his visible presence if we insult him by indulging it. We cannot be in this state of unbelief. And wherever we find it, we got to change it. And it's as simple as reading the Bible and believing what it says. That's it. It's that easy. It's that simple. And a lot of people will say, well, it's really not that easy. About what? What part of it isn't easy? If the Lord said that's what he's going to do, we believe it. You know, it's real easy to go prove all the other things that have been done. We know where all the sites are now. All the places that were thought to be fairy tales have all risen up out of the ground. We know where every one of them is. 
it was thought for golly near a thousand years for sure just the last 600 that you know whenever they started putting the writing together Jericho never existed then they found it just a, just a, just a, so many years ago they found it they found it in our generation the actual city of Jericho there's a bunch of other sites that were thought to not not exist they uh, when they were talking about Joseph and whenever he was Pharaoh's right hand man they're like well that that obviously didn't happen we have no you know uh, evidence in Egypt about that then all of a sudden they started finding it they even found his pyramid Joseph has a pyramid that he built for himself in Turkey I think there's another one in Egypt and now we've since found out that he is the one who designed all the pyramids so those pyramids aren't that old they're older than people think but they're not not as old as people originally assumed Turns out his name is written all over the world. All the major big me megalithic projects, his name is on them. There's a whole lot of stuff that people didn't really believe, but it's all come true. So it's really easy for us to go in and prove these things. But if we're going to say, well, like people sit this Sunday morning, people are in church this morning. They're about to be. It's almost 10, my time. So they're about to be in church. And there's people that are sitting in church listening to the Bible being preached that don't believe Jesus died on the cross. Why don't you believe what the Bible says? Yet you're sitting in a church listening to that same Bible being preached. There's a problem. Why do they entertain this level of unbelief? No, he just fainted. No, he died. His physical form died. And then it rose a brand new thing, a new creation. They don't believe that. That's a terrible thing to not believe Jesus died. That's literally the gospel. They don't believe the gospel. And yet people consider them Christians. You're not a Christian if you don't believe the gospel. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. And yet they entertain this unbelief. And it dishonors Christ to do so. It is true. It is a weed, the seeds of which we and never entirely extract from the soil. But we must aim at its root with zeal and perseverance. You can't ever get rid of it. You know, if you know anything about soil, you go out there and you let a field go fallow. And then you go out there and you cut everything down to the ground. And you spray killer on it and you kill everything. And it's just dirt. And then you come springtime. Okay, I need to get some hay growing here. So I'm going to go out there and I'll plow it up. You go roll it over with a plow. All of a sudden, all these weeds start coming up. Because the seed sits underground. And every time you do it, you get more and more seed come up. You just, more weeds come up. So you have to go through there. And, and what they do is they do use a, a hot water molasses. And they dilute the molasses in the hot water. And then they spray it on the ground. And it fluffs the soil up. It's a natural way of plowing without using a mechanical plow. And it keeps the weeds from growing. Then you can plant whatever else you want there. A way of use, of doing it without using chemicals to kill the weeds but that seed is still there it's always there you know where there's a bare spot at in your yard go out there and dig dig down six inches and roll the dirt over and they just leave it all of a sudden all these green shoots will come up the, the, the seeds are always there we're always wrestling with it we're always fighting with it sometimes those little thoughts will pop into our head i wonder if that really is true it's Satan messing with us. Push that away. Pull that seed out and throw it in the trash. Throw it in the fire. Aim it at root with zeal and perseverance. Among hateful things, it is the most to be abhorred. Its injurious nature is so venomous that he that exercises sizeth it, and he upon whom it is exercised, are both hurt thereby. In thy case, O believer, in thy case, O believer, it is most wicked. For the mercies of thy Lord in the past increase thy guilt in doubting him now. When thou dost distrust the Lord Jesus, he may well cry out, Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. This is crowning his head with thorns of the sharpest kind. It is very cruel for a well-beloved wife to mistrust a kind and faithful husband. 
Very cool. I've actually lived with that. <laughs> the sin is needless, foolish, and unwarranted. Jesus has never given the slightest ground for suspicion. Jesus has never given the slightest ground for suspicion, and it is hard to be doubted by those to whom our conduct is uniformly affectionate and true. Who do you hurt more by distrust? It's the person closest to you. Jesus is the son of the highest and has unbounded wealth. It is shameful to doubt omnipotence and distrust all sufficiency. When you say the Bible isn't true, that's what you're doing. All those people out there talking about the Bible was mistranslated and been changed, black magic and Satan. This is what they're doing. They don't believe him because God said in the Old Testament, my word shall stand forever. Jesus said in the New Testament, my word shall stand forever. God, Old Testament, Jesus, New Testament. Jesus actually is all the way through it. But he said, my word shall stand forever. And people don't believe him. How can you consider yourself a Christian if you don't believe his word is true and that he will preserve it? What a terrible thing. The cattle on a thousand hills will suffice for our most hungry feeding, and the granaries of heaven are not likely to be emptied by our eating. If Christ were only a cistern, <clears throat> we might soon exhaust his fullness. But who can drain a fountain? A fountain flows forever. Myriads of spirits have drawn their supplies from him, and not one of them has murmured at the scantiness of his resources. Away, then, with this lying traitor unbelief. For his only errand is to cut the bonds of communion and make us mourn an absent Savior. Bunyan tells us that unbelief has as many lives as a cat. If so, let us kill one life now and continue the work till the whole nine are gone. Down with thee, thou traitor, my heart abhors thee. We must change our minds about these things. Well, I believe this, but I don't believe this. Why don't you believe that? I just don't see how that can be true. It's not up to you, and it's not according to your perspective. It's according to his. If he said it, it's true. You cannot sit there and say, I believe this part of the Bible, but I don't believe this part. I believe these things, but I don't believe these things. The problem here is you don't believe any of it. You just want to look good, so you're believing key, key parts. <clears throat> That's not a Christian. A Christian, a true born-again believer, believes the whole word of God, believes all of his father's words. If his father made a promise, if his Lord made a promise, he believes it. If his father says, this is how things are, if his Lord says, this is how things are, he believes it. Now, we all have to ask ourselves the question, is there something in the Bible we don't believe? Is there any verse or scripture or story or doctrine that you don't believe that is stated in the Bible? Go find it and go read it again and think about this. Why would he say that? If I believe every everything else in this book is true, why would he say that and me not believe it? Why should I not believe it if everything else he said was true? I need to change my mind and say, you know what? I do believe this. Lord, I do believe your word. I believe your whole word. I need to change my mind and my attitude about this. Drive out unbelief. There are people that, that are going on about, you know what? I think we're all wrong about this rapture thing. It's not going to happen. It's all a mistake. Really? Where's your unbelief coming from? There are people that say, well, I'm looking at my situation and, and I don't think the Lord is going to provide for me. From whose perspective? Yours or his? If it's from yours, you'll always be disappointed. But if you're looking at it from his perspective, you will never be disappointed. See, we have the very unique quality of looking at things the wrong way all the time. And we always make that mistake. Quick to judge, slow to listen. And even whenever it's happening right in front of our very eyes, it's not going to happen. You know, and let me, let me throw this out there for you to meditate on. If Jesus Christ was to appear right now today and say, okay, guys, all the TVs pointed at him, all the stuff. I mean, he made it happen. Everybody's like, we don't know what's going on, but all our cameras are on. We're filmed in on this guy. And he's standing somewhere that everybody knows. 
And, he, and people are there watching. And he says, all right, y'all, here's what's going to happen. I've come to show you and to tell you the truth. And he's in his shining glory and everything. And he lays it all out for him and says, this is, this is how this is going to play out. And he shows us in the word, here's where it is, and this is what it means. Do you know less than 1% of the people that witness it will actually believe it? Because less than 1% of the people are actually saved, are actually ready, are actually prepared, are actually born again, and fully sold on the Lord. You might get 1%, but I believe the number is probably less than that. They won't believe what they're seeing, even though you can go right into the book of Revelation and he, if he looks exactly what John described, people still won't believe it. Oh, it's AI. Oh, it's a robot. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. It's special effects. They'll find a reason to not believe it. This is what God was dealing with in Numbers. I've shown you, I literally was appeared and gave you a personal escort as a pillar of smoke during the day because the smoke gave you shade from the sun while you traveled and a pillar of fire at night to light the whole area where you were standing. And you still don't believe. They walked on the glass the fire made in the sand as it went before them. Did you know that glass is still there? They can follow the trail. They know where it's at. They, they, they can see right where it's at and follow along where the, where the sand, the heat made glass in the sand. It's still there. Go to the Red Sea that where the crossing is. There's glass on both sides. And they're like, it takes a lot. Of, it takes a whole lot of heat to make this. Like, we don't know how it happened because it doesn't, it's, it's nowhere else. It's only here. And it makes a path and they can follow it. Some of it's buried. Some of it's exposed. Brought quail into a place that still go there, by the way. Brought quail into a place to feed them where no nothing existed. There's nothing there for them. Why would the quail go there? Brought water out of stones. Bread rained down from heaven. I mean, how much more would he need to do? How much more could he do? Made the ground open up and suck a bunch of them down. Thousands, a couple thousand of them down. What more could he do? And Christians today, for the most part, are almost the same way as they were these thousands of years ago. They don't believe. They won't look up. They won't look at the word and go, yeah, you know what? That makes sense. They they literally can go and say, well, you know what? I read this in here, but I don't agree with it. I read this in here, but I don't believe it. I read this in here, but yeah, I don't think that, that matters. Every single word in this book matters. They just can't bring themselves to do it. There's, they just don't have the ability, or it could be a block. It could be the Lord has put a block on their mind so they, they can't do it. He's turned them over to a depraved mind. Turned them over to their unbelief. What a terrible thing to be so close and yet so far away. Reminds me of the sheep and goats judgment. Lord, look what we did in your name. We prophesied. We did all these things. Look what we did in your name. And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity into I'll be cast into outer darkness. What a terrible thing to be that close and that far away at the same time because they don't believe. They don't truly believe. They don't even believe Jesus is real. You know how many Christians today don't believe Jesus is a living, breathing person? They don't. They just can't wrap their brain around it. 2,000 years ago when he rose, they were able to grab him and touch him. They have this famous story in the Bible of Thomas actually putting his finger through the holes in his wrist. The holes are still there. You can breach through them. And putting his hand up inside his ribcage. Inside his body. They watched him eat. He says, I have flesh and bone. I'm not a spirit. He's a living person. And he sits at the right hand of the Father. Now think about that for a minute. Because a lot of people don't because nobody talks about this. Think about that for a minute. Jesus is just like us, except he has, there's no blood in his body. He's a different creation. We have blood in ours. 
but it, he's just like us. You can reach down. I'm grabbing my arm. Now I can touch my arm. I can go and I can embrace my wife. I can touch her body and feel her. Jesus is the same way right now at this very second. Residing in heaven on the throne with the Father. You know how many people don't believe that? Because they just can't believe that that's true. Well, very shortly, they're all about to. Because he's going to reveal himself and show himself to them and say, Here I am. What an amazing thing as a believer to come to the place where you are fully, so fully sold that you know he is alive, that you know that when he does stand here in spirit, his physical body can be here too at the same time. He can exist in both realms at the same time. He's an actual person. So when I talk to the Lord, I talk to him like I'm talking to you, to my wife, to my son, to my daughter. other than the fact that he's the Lord. But to me, he's so real that just because I can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. Go into a room and close the door and talk to somebody through the door. How do you know they're really there? Well, I hear their voice. But how do you know they're actually there? How do you know they don't have a speaker set up and they've gone to another part of the house and they're talking to you through the speaker? How do you know they're there just because you hear their voice? Well, I just know. Well, why can't we believe that about Jesus? We hear his voice. Every time we open this Bible up and read it out loud, we hear his voice. His spirit dwells within you. Your voice becomes his when you read this word out loud. We so badly miss this, and it is so detrimental to the church and to the walk that we have when we don't believe the Bible is true, when we don't believe Jesus is a real being, a real person, when we don't believe everything that it tells us, but instead believe what we want to. We must change that as believers. If you want to honor the Lord, that's, that's a great way to start. Believe the Bible. Believe what it says. I've talked to people personally. I just I just don't fully, even in my last church, there was a person, you know, I, I just don't fully, I just can't fully grasp how he was raised from the dead. So you don't believe the gospel? No, no, I believe it. But no, you don't, because that's part of it. But they just can't bring themselves to believe that he was raised from the dead. That's a terrible, terrible thing. A terrible thing to, to have to come to that admission. And they were okay with it. They didn't bother them. That person has a problem. That person has a terrible problem. And we all do if we can't bring ourselves to believe what this word says. Read it and believe it face value. The Lord will teach you everything else you need to know after that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. It's that simple. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory and to lift you up and to sing praises under your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. Why don't we believe you? Why don't we believe your word? We struggle every day to believe people, doctors, lawyers, police officers, there's so many people today we can't trust and we don't believe in, especially the last couple of years has ruined most people for believing anyone in any professional field because they all lie. Politicians, leaders, governors, judges, we just don't believe anybody because they're all liars, they're all broken, they're all thieves, and they all take care of their own agenda instead of worrying about the people they should be worrying about, the people they were put in charge over the people you put them in charge over. And it's so hard for people to come to a place where they can just implicitly trust somebody. And something you gave me a long time ago was to trust people without doubting until they betrayed that trust. And even though I've become very wary of people, I, I still, I still have that. And I noticed that, you know, I, I, somebody says something, I trust them even if I see red flags, but I trust them until they prove otherwise. 
one of the things that brought me to you was that I could trust you. And then you proved that I could trust you. And so I have no reason to doubt anything you say, even though there's people out there trying desperately to lead us into other directions and the pits of darkness. Well, they can go there by themselves. I have no interest in following them there because the one thing you did that nobody else has ever been able to do is to show me what you say and then prove that it's real. And you have done that beyond any shadow of doubt. But why do we not believe the Jews back then? Just even seeing what they saw still didn't believe. How is it now that we see the things that we see and people still don't? There are people today still walking around that do not believe we're in the end. And yet all the signs you gave, and you said when you begin to see these things, okay, well, that was about 10 years ago. Look up, your redemption draweth nigh. And we see clear connections to all these things. Why don't people believe? They just don't want to do it. Well, you're about to put on a show. You're about to wake everybody up. You're about to put out the call. Because when you reveal yourself, you're taking those that do believe, those that are watching, those that are yours away. And then the whole world is going to know the truth beyond a shadow of a doubt. The whole world is going to get kick-started. And they're going to have to make a decision. Unfortunately, it's going to cost them a lot. But, Father, why don't we believe? Lord Jesus, why don't we believe? Lord, it just boggles my mind that there's people that don't believe you're an actual person, that you're just a thought, you're just a way of doing things, you're a mindset. You're an actual living, breathing person, alive in every sense of the word. They don't believe that. Why? Why don't they believe that? Your word tells us that. So they don't believe the word. The natural conclusion comes is they don't believe. So if they don't believe, they're not saved. Your word says, if you believe, you shall have eternal life. And, and what I started to realize, Lord, is that there's a whole lot more people that don't believe than do. And that believing, not only is it simpler than what we've, what we realize, but it's also much less complicated than what we realize. But at the same time, for most people, it's too complicated to just simply believe. Lord, I believe your word is true 100%. I believe you are alive and well, sitting on the throne, about to return. I believe, Father, that you are in full control over everything. Whatever your word says, I believe it. I am sold on that. And what I don't know, I will know soon enough. And I will believe it too, because you are the one true God. There is no true thing anywhere except for you. And yet today we have people walking around, just like the Jews did those thousands of years ago, seeing what they're seeing, knowing what they know, still can't bring themselves to believe. What a terrible thing. What a terrible state to be in. What a terrible, what a terrible loss that this very morning they're sitting in the church and they're putting their hands in the air saying hallelujah, saying their prayers, and yet they're no closer than an atheist. They're no closer than any other unbeliever. Why can't we believe? Father, I pray you take this unbelief out of us. Help our unbelief. Make us to believe, especially as your children. Those of us who are awake now, seeing these things, as they're unfolding, this, this very tiny percentage of, of the church as a whole, the remnant, take any unbelief that exists within us out of us and put up a firewall around us, put up a brick wall around us that nobody can get. Nobody can get through us. Nobody can get into us to cause us to unbelief. Nobody can put any seeds, clean the soil so that there's no seeds of unbelief there. That we may walk boldly in your truth, in your strength, in your grace, in your mercy, and in your salvation. And that when we read this word, it's more true to us than anything else. I read the labels on food and, and medicines, and, and I don't hardly believe any of them. Some of it, but not all of it. Your word is the only thing I 100% believe and trust. Because everything else in this world has failed me. Everything else in this world has been a lie, but you, Lord, you are always the beacon of truth.
that we can all rely on. 100%. Every time. And we eagerly long and await for your arrival to come back and bring justice and to set things right, to put things back the way they should be, and to correct false understandings across the board. Father, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. If you believe the Word of God, believe all of it. Don't believe parts of it. Believe all of it. There's people today that believe all of it, but everything Paul wrote, not realizing there's some other stuff that Paul contributed to that they don't realize, yet they believe those. Those are fine. There are people today sitting in church this very morning as I'm recording this and don't believe Jesus died or rose from the dead, or that God is omnipotent, or that salvation is by grace through faith. They don't believe it. They can't believe it. What a terrible thing. What a terrible thing. There's people sitting in church today that don't believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. They think there are many ways to heaven. I'm looking at you, Oprah. I'm looking at you, Joel Osteen. There are many people that think that today. In fact, the majority of what is called the church today does that. Well, luckily, there's a remnant that doesn't. There's a remnant that knows the truth and believes that truth, his truth, the truth of Jesus Christ. Let us always walk in that truth. Not ours, not somebody else's, his. And let us prove everything through his word that we know is true. Because when we do that, the filter takes out all the impurities. The filter takes out all the false doctrines, takes out all the misunderstandings. And we walk in a way that is congruent with God and in a way that glorifies him naturally. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. In his holy name, I pray that you all truly believe all things concerning God. I will see you in the next video.